Security. Uh, my name is Dennis Egan, and I am the Assistant Director of the Cicada Center. The Cicada Center is our uh, DHS Science and Technology Center of Excellence. Uh, we've been in business for about a dozen years, starting off being in the Dynam, which is probably in the last 10 or so years we've been named Cicada. Uh, this panel has two big challenges, I think. One is to give you just a glimpse of many, many different kinds of security research uh, that has been going on in Cicada over the last dozen years or so. And the other is um, to get this all done within 60 minutes uh, with seven panelists. Uh, so we just learned that we are down to six panelists because one of them, uh, Danny DiLorenzi from uh, MetLife Stadium, uh, has uh, been detained because uh, MetLife is, is expecting a severe weather forecast for this weekend, and he has to make preparations for that. Uh, so that gives us a little bit more time per, per panelist. Uh, I'd like to begin with the first panelist, who is Paul Cantor. Um, Paul is a uh, distinguished professor of uh, of library science, library and information science, science at Rutgers. Uh, he's now emeritus. Uh, he is also uh, the former research director uh, for Cicada. And I'm putting Paul first because he talks about the research of a number of the other panelists in his presentation. And he also has a specific request that will require audience participation at the beginning. Paul? explanation for that uh, personal request. Um, in my retirement, I'm trying to become a cruise ship lecturer uh, because it's got a lot of great perks. Uh, the companies want to see a live video of an entertaining lecture. Uh, so with your permission, my wife is videotaping you. <clears throat> Just in case this talk is a disaster, I'd like you to do two things now. Please applaud as if I had done a good job. <laughs> Thank you very much, and this one's a little tougher. Laugh as if I just said something funny. <laughs> All right, uh, now we can get down to business or your email. <clears throat> uh, there's a wonderful statement that all research is basic until it's needed, and one of my great teachers was Sam Eilenberg, the mathematician, who said, think of me as a tailor, but I make jackets with any number of arms. If someone happens to have two arms and wants one of my jackets, that's fine, but that's not why I make jackets. However, when the World Trade Centers were attacked, the United States quickly invited selected NSF researchers to assemble an ad hoc effort to accelerate science on behalf of Homeland Security. Of course, Fred was one of the people they invited. And he returned to campus and quickly assembled teams of researchers to work on problems of importance. Uh, and I may have it wrong, Fred, but the first one I could remember at Dynamic Data Analysis, DIDAN, was working with the intelligence community on questions such as, who, can you tell me who is the author of this if he didn't sign it? And those of you who are interested in statistics know that this has been studied in the context of the Federalist Papers for quite a long time. Uh, and that's done by the style and content of the document. Uh, there's also been work that we got involved in on doing it by affiliation among persons. Uh, the result of this is that Fred and I are co-authors of a paper whose title, as Hillary Clinton would say, what does that letter U mean? Uh, the title is unclassified, monitoring message streams, etc. But it's published in a journal that neither of us is allowed to read. 
So it's our one classified public case. It's the only one I have. Uh, Fred proved willing to work on absolutely anything. So professor of math is really wrong. It's really polymath. He assembled a very diverse team. And fortunately, uh, David Banks showed me how to deal with a slide like this. I can't possibly read all of it, but if everyone reads one word, we'll be OK. Uh, many faculty research colleagues, Dave Lewis, Alex Genkin, uh, Einar Dianic, these were students at the time, Andre Angelescu, Dimitri Fratkin, uh, Al and Warren are here right now, holding down the opposite end of the table. And these are just some of the publications that came out of that early work on applying mathematics to identifying persons and authors. Uh, we also did a lot of work on nuclear threat detection. There were two projects, the little one and the big one. Fred headed the big one. Um, I was co-PI on the little one, so I'll talk about that. Uh, the idea is that if you're trying to find out whether a container has bad stuff in it, highly enriched uranium or something like that, there are several different tests you can do, and they're all imperfect. And the folks at Los Alamos figured out that if you were smart, you'd take the result of the first test and decide how to set the threshold on the second test and decide how to set the threshold on the third test. And they managed to solve the problem for four sensors, but it took uh, more than a day to run. Uh, so we worked on it, and we is particularly Andre Boros, but I think it's possible Jake Barron, who's here, was working on it, and Noam Goldberg. Um, we found a very clever solution using dynamic programming, which cut one day of computation down time to a couple of minutes. We're very proud of that. Uh, Fred's arm did many kinds of approaches, but one of the most interesting was to search in the space of trees, uh, which he did with Dave Madigan. I think Dave is not, not here today. Um, that was Didan, but then we became the Command Control and Interoperability Center for Advanced Data Analysis, Bogshemoy, as Tom Lehrer would say. Um, as you can imagine, uh, Nina, whom you've heard, had a big role in the selection of the acronym and the icon. Um, and I have to say that um, as I watched people struggle with pronouncing our name, and, and Detlaf von Winterfeld, who's German, always pronounced us Chicada. But I'm reminded of a very old song about k, -k, -k katie and I won't try to sing it for you because no one deserves that. Um, here's a list of a few more of the people. And uh, who's here in the room now? Uh, Brian Nakamura is here. Uh, is Brian Thompson here? Brian Thompson is here. Brian Ricks, I think, is not. Um, and in red, it's right here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Samoa has, oh, yes. yeah. OK. Uh, we did some interesting work on urban security. Um, and Fred gave several talks on it, particularly one at the Homeland Security Conference. It was a huge collaboration with the CREATE Center and the Mineta Transportation Institute involving economics, effectiveness, planning for where to place inspections, and so forth. Uh, we produced a several hundred page unpublished book asking questions and answering, or offering answers. How does security and economics influence each other? What do we really mean by the costs and the benefits of security? And what about the intangibles, like whether people feel safe if we're making them open their pocketbooks? And perhaps most subtle, how do you assess the possibility of mixing together several different security measures? We also did a good deal of work with the US Coast Guard. Um, perhaps most interesting was the question of how can the US Coast Guard decide which fishing vessels to inspect? Dennis just told me I only have two minutes, and I'm not 7 tenths of the way through. 
Um, how do you decide which vessels to inspect in order to catch violations? We approach this in several ways, uh, statistics, learning trees. Um, unfortunately, the bottom line was if they only had to catch bad guys, they could definitely up their effectiveness. But when we showed them that, they said, yeah, and we also have to inspect everybody every three years for safety. So you have to look at the other ones. Uh, that's a picture of fish. We also did some work with them on where to station rescue vessels. Um, if you've ever thought about it, po Coast Guard stations are still placed far enough apart that you can row the boat to the sinking ship, but that's not needed anymore. Uh, and we helped them to figure out how they might share vessels. Right now, we're in the middle of working on criminal record screening. We've developed something which is now called CHEETA, which I, doesn't mean cheating, I think it means is a very fast system. It automatically processes criminal records from multiple states. And um, we're still in the middle of the process, but we've already been able to show that it's very good at identifying records that do not have any bad information on them. And since that's the majority of the records, that should save them quite a lot of time. Very nice, complex reasoner. I have to mention Vladimir Menkov because he's built it himself. And Eli Honig, who's our legal specialist, and many of you know him because he appears frequently on CNN. He's a former prosecutor. Uh, this is what's inside the cheetah reasoner, and I see Dennis writing zero there, so I will not. <laughs> Uh, and it's a very complicated project, so it's got all these parts. Uh, we have also done a lot of work with large venues and the people who come to them. We've developed tools for um, assessing and simulating various ways of screening people who are coming to the stadium because you want to make sure that they're not bringing anything bad but they want to be sitting down at kickoff. And Dennis has just given me the big zero, and I was going to hand it right over to Danny DiLorenzo, <laughs> who could talk about the stadium work, but unfortunately, he's not here. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next, Ed, you, you can either stand or or sit, but you need okay. to you need to use that particular yes, clicker. I, yes. for you. <laughs> All right. We have uh, Leela uh, Gemery from the Department of Computer Science at Texas Southern University, and I would just like to say, if you haven't had a chance yet, please read her reflection in the uh, in the program. It's very nice, very well done. Leela, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction, and uh, I am going to to speak uh, to about two. Um, two projects that my students did, and they were inspired by a stay in the, so I should direct this way. Okay. So <laughs> online social networks, we are all familiar with them. We, uh, we, we like them, we use them, and, but some of the time they come and bite us. Uh, so that was part of the study that uh, uh, we did. So these are the few of them, so, but they've been very popular and they've been growing. So some of the statistics here is that we see in 2005, only five adults in the United States were using them. In 2019, we have 69% of the adults using them. The um, table below shows that uh, the, uh, the, uh, how many, stu uh, how many uh, people are by age, uh, by age uh, section and what, what uh, type of uh, uh, online social networks that they use. So we see that at the top is still uh, Facebook. Facebook is a country by itself, as they say it. It's more than, uh, I think, 200 million or 300 million participants, and with millions and millions of posts posting every day. And then followed by Instagram, which is more popular with, uh, uh, with the 22, 24, I think, uh, trench. But uh, since the Facebook owns Instagram, they're really, we're talking about the same company. So how did we, uh, how did I get interested into that? That was during a summer uh, 2012, a summer research at, at DIMAC. 
And um, there is another story about how I, I got here because uh, we had applied, Fred of course is always suggesting do this, do that, do this, do that. So he said, well, do, why don't you apply to the summer, uh, uh, I think research for faculty at uh, DIMAC. And I did, and I was rejected. So there was no explanation. And actually, when I, it was about two weeks before the deadline, and I said, are you sure? He said, yes, just talk to Rebecca. So I talked to Rebecca. Rebecca and Aaron got together, uh, wrote a draft, and we had a couple of conference calls, and then we set up the final proposal, submitted it, and they said, no. Okay, so I was very disappointed. And then uh, Fred came back and said, okay, maybe we can find a way for you to come. And he did find a way for me to come and spend uh, about 10 weeks at Rutgers. There was another student uh, from uh, TSU, Jude Ujmo, who was, uh, who was uh, doing his REU here. So we got together, Rebecca Wright, uh, Aaron, uh, Jude, and myself. And we worked on accountability in online social networks. So of course, I knew about social networks, but I didn't know much about accountability. And then that got the, uh, you know, the training part that I had, uh, in which uh, uh, Rebecca and Aaron introduced the um, accountability framework that was defined by uh, John. And then we had to study uh, some social networks under those uh, specific criteria. So we studied Facebook, Twitter, the microblog in Twitter, uh, Foursquare, which was a location-based uh, uh, online social networks, and Diaspora, which was a decentralized uh, um, uh, online social networks. And of course, we wrote a nice big report that's sitting on the shelves, <laughs> but we got something out of it. So the pros is that, of course, uh, people like online social networks. They willingly and lovingly participate in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in interacting with people uh, through online social net, uh, networks because they keep they keep them in contact with friends and family and improves their quality of life. They you know there is an exchange of ideas and ideas dissemination that we cannot really uh, dispute. This is, it is there. However, of course, the, it exposes the user to go government and corporate intrusions. Uh, there are threats and very valid threats of cyberbullying. Uh, it harms the productivity, there were research on that, and of misinformation dissemination that is, uh, now it's very, very current, okay, that we see. So as far as privacy um, uh, uh, threats that were discovered, uh, most, I mean, there were a few of them, but I focused on these. So the uh, unwanted disclosures, fake accounts, and data retention. So these were all very uh, prominent uh, problems, privacy violation problems with online social networks. So uh, people post something, they forget who is in their Facebook account or Twitter account, and suddenly, uh, and we've seen that suddenly, I mean, some uh, negative uh, repercussion or consequences happen uh, in the sense that they get fired, uh, or some uh, job offer get withdrawn and because of some comments they made. So this is really coming with online social networks that these problems did not happen before because as a human, we have our social spheres. So each one of us have their social spheres and we know intuitively what we can share in that social sphere. So I know who to inform about what I ate yesterday, and I know what to, who to inform about who I met at uh, uh, DIMAC uh, yesterday, and so on. And these first, usually they don't, uh, they don't, uh, you know, they, they, they're separate. But with the online social network, they were all collapsed in one. And uh, so if, uh, if I, if I put something, it's going to be read by my colleagues, by my brothers and sisters, by uh, my neighbors, whoever is in, the, in that social. And that's where the problem is, is that people, uh, we lost, there, there are some um, privacy settings, but most people don't pay attention to them, or they're too coarse, and uh, so we don't get that control over our data. The fake accounts is a current problem, we see it with, uh, uh, 
it, it's a political issue more than anything, and the data retention. We don't know how long uh, Facebook or Twitter keeps our data. Really, we don't know. There is no rules, and we, we, we studied that really very thoroughly, and there was no policy about how long uh, they, uh, they retain the data. So, the solutions that uh, we came up with, um, there were two, two, two applications that we, uh, we started developing. One is on privacy protection using multiple profiles. So instead of having, and that's really an attempt to bring back that separation of spheres. So my professional uh, entourage is here, my family entourage is here, my friends are here, and this is what we try to do on top of, uh, so build a, an app on top of Facebook that will uh, allow a person to really say, okay, this is, I define this profile, which is going to be my family profile, and I'm gonna put these people in it, and when I'm trying to post something that I feel my family should know, but not my boss, I will post it here. Uh, the other one for the fake uh, account, uh, not the fake account, this we have not tackled, but for the data retention, we, uh, we design, or that my students designed uh, privacy protection through ephemeral messaging. That is a message that is sent or a posting that is made and that disappears and gets deleted completely um, after five minutes. So these students was um, uh, Emma Hamilton, Sabra, uh, Sabrina, and then, uh, uh, and then uh, Andre, and then Terence. So they both were. So this is the privacy protection through multiple profiles, and that's what we mean by the multiple profiles. So we can create, we can be our own persona, or create our different personas, and have uh, the, the, the spheres being separated so we don't get into that unwanted disclosure uh, problem. And then the social media application with private messaging, this is how it works, so it was completely um, implemented on the iOS, and. Uh, which we, I mean, it was tested and it was nicely done. Now, um, after, you know, these things are getting worse. Privacy uh, issues are getting worse rather than getting, you know, better. And thinking back about it, I really, I, I doubt that there will be a technological solution to it. I think it's more an education solution. So we have to educate a smarter and security savvy student population. Uh, the students or anybody, okay, is, is privacy really dead? We see that in Europe, uh, there are privacy laws that are very stringent, that are, there are companies that are coming up and that are validating an app or software, uh, privacy, it's privacy and security before it's, it's being released. So the U.S. has a long way to go through that. But uh, I feel as educators, we also have uh, things to do. So what we're starting to do in the computer science department is to add a security and privacy component in some key computer science courses. And then for the non-CS majors, we are presenting seminars on data privacy and protection. So and this is, these are how it's, it's, uh, it has been uh, defined, and, uh, and this is, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think we should jump to the next panelist immediately. Uh, if we have time, we'll take questions at the end. The next panelist is Brad Greening. Um, he is a, health scientist and mathematical modeler at the Center for D Disease Control and Prevention. Brad? Thank you, Dennis. Uh, so I am gonna take a bit of a different course here in the sense that I'm not gonna talk specifically about any one project that I worked on. Uh, and that's because at CDC, uh, well, in this crowd anyway, when we think about security, a lot of times we think about cryptography or privacy issues or any number of physical or uh, terrorism related security applications. Uh, but I would maintain that uh, public health also serves as a security function. And most obviously in the realm of 
uh, perhaps bioterrorism, but even in uh, normal things like, well, normal to me, <laughs> like the spread of infectious diseases, uh, maintaining a healthy population is certainly a, an aspect of security, uh, in my opinion. And so uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit actually about how uh, Dimax has, has helped me to sort of bridge that, that gap, if you will. Uh, so my day-to-day my -day job at CDC, you heard Michael Washington yesterday talk about uh, a lot of the, the teaching components that we do. And that is, even when we're not formally teaching, uh, a major chunk of what we do. Because, uh, as you heard a, a little bit this morning in the education panel, there is uh, a need f to increase computational thinking, if I can say that, uh, um, among a large swath of the population. And so a, a lot of what we do before we even get to the actual uh, mathematical modeling or, or resource allocation problems that we work on uh, in our team, we do have to spend a great chunk of time working with the requesters of these projects uh, on things as basic as clarifying what question we're actually answering. And you would think that that would be a pretty straightforward process, but uh, it really is something that we have to focus on. And so I am very grateful to Dimax and Cicada uh, where I did some of my graduate studies uh, for f sort of fostering this ability to be able to speak and think across disciplines and pick from different buckets, if you will, to put together a solution that perhaps might not have been possible uh, if it was only myself working on it or the requester of the project only themselves working on it. And so I think that sort of uh, transdisciplinary ability existed but was really brought out of me uh, during my time at Dimex. Uh, with regard to specific projects, I had a couple of conversations with a few of you over the last couple of days. Uh, a lot of the work that we do on the Health Economics and Modeling Unit does boil down to really uh, two major buckets, I suppose. There's the bucket of work that we will do uh, when there's an emergency happening. Uh, and so up until last week, for example, we were working almost exclusively on work related to the outbreak of Ebola in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, the only reason we're now not working on it is because we had a substitute team come in and give us a little spell after about 400 and some days of working almost exclusively on Ebola. Uh, so this particular bucket of work is related to, to things that we do and, and that I did at DIMAX in the sense that uh, it takes a lot of the methodology that's developed here uh, during what I would refer to as a, as a peacetime work uh, and simplifies it so that we are able to use it quickly and we're able to use what little data we have on hand, uh, no matter what quality that may be, and give leadership an answer that is as data-driven as we can. Uh, my team lead will frequently refer to the answer as perhaps being not as precise as we would like, but as allowing us to see through that fog of war, if you will, uh, a little bit better than we would have been able to uh, just through soliciting expert opinion. The other bucket of major work is, is the peacetime bucket of work. And there, uh, we have a little bit more time to be more precise, but there also, and especially recently, we've been having a, a particular emphasis on uh, impact and trying to educate some of our colleagues 
around some of the methodologies that we can use to show how some of these interventions that are being done in public health are actually improving the health of the public as opposed to the traditional evaluation that has been done at CDC for a while, which is really good for management processes. It tells you things like, oh, we purchased this many lab machines or we hired this many staff, we conducted this many tests, but it doesn't go as far as to say how it impacted the health of the public, which, as you can imagine, when a funding body or a, a legislative body comes down and wants to know where their money went, they're not as impressed with how many people you hired as what the impact of those people were. Uh, and so, all that, all that to say, I think that my experience at, at DIMAX really was crucial in allowing me to have what success I've had at CDC through bringing out that ability to understand where the mathematical problems lie, the ability to be able to explain in the other person's language why a mathematical solution is important to them, how it improves their field. Uh, and selfishly for me, it means I get to learn new things all the time. So uh, that works out pretty well for me. I think that's all I have. Okay, our next panelist is Asamoa Nkwanta, who is a professor of mathematics at Morgan State University. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, probably going to take a little different slant, but uh, Morgan State, for those of you who've been to Morgan State, we usually refer to it as the great Morgan State. So <laughs> if, if you, you want to know what that means, just ask anyone who's been to Morgan. But we are one of the four HBCUs that are um, part of this uh, celebration. And I just want to kind of kind of um, come from an angle in terms of um, how DIMAX has really impacted our students and our faculty, as um, Aziz has already kind of mentioned. And another institution, Morgan State University in Baltimore, um, has really been impacted through the uh, DIMAX leadership in terms of giving us an opportunity to, to uh, be part of the discussion in these areas in terms of surveillance and, and, and bioterrorism, et cetera. We were part of the uh, team, you know, and I recall times we would be on uh, the phone calls of 20 or 30 people. And if you still had something to say, Fred would still allow you the time to, to get your, your point in. And, and that doesn't always happen with centers where you are part of the leadership team and you have a voice and you have a place at the table and that's valued. And so I just wanted to, to say that in terms of my DIMAX experience from coming in as a maybe associate professor, but my first encounter with Diana, Di, DIMAX was in 1995 or six. It was the second uh, uh, conference for African American researchers in the mathematical sciences where a lot of talks were showcased on uh, African Americans and research. And I had heard of Fred Roberts through his books on graph theory and, and various applications of math. And then in 2000, I was asked to to be a consultant on diversity, and I came and spent a few weeks here at, at Rutgers and kind of really didn't know what I was getting into, but it's been a long, fruitful uh, collaboration, authentic collaboration um, that started with DIDAN and some other acronyms I can't remember. But we did write um, a, a, a uh, story about the DIMAX and Cicada, well, the Cicada story around um, all of the projects that is published in one of the IGI volumes, if anyone is interested in, in going and read, and it summarizes some of the projects that have been mentioned here. And um, I think the main thing I want to say about 
uh, the surveillance and, and security issue is that we've had a number of students participate in um, the Cicada and Dimax, Dimax REUs, and they have um, um, benefited treme tremendously. Now, this is a metric that's usually not captured by NSF or other fund funding agencies in terms of that impact, in terms of their, their um, confidence and their um, the scope of the projects that students are exposed to. They come back and they tell me about, you know, I'm working on this stadium evacuation model, you know, and I never knew this, these type of programs or these type of um, methods, and it just broadens them and it focuses them. And I, I didn't put any slides together, but I, I could, could have uh, prepared maybe 10, 12 students that have come through uh, the uh, programs here that are have their PhDs or working in industry. Uh, one of the uh, one of our former student, well, current PhD students was a, a 2016 uh, REU student working on topological data data um, analysis on fring, fingerprint uh, analysis, and so he just gave a talk yesterday on his to his PhD committee. So that project sparked his interest, and that project is a project he's still working on. And so it's just been um, a long collaboration, and I would hope that we continue it in the future under the, the, the incoming director in terms of um, um, just making sure that that diversity is there from the point of view that, as was mentioned in, in some of the earlier talks, we're going to need a lot of different people to solve a lot of the different types of challenges around, you know, um, artificial intelligence, encryption. Um, it, 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 it's, it's just such a massive problem and, and different perspectives, different experiences, different backgrounds will contribute, contribute to the problem, problems and solutions. And so um, I think that's what, what I really wanted to say and, and thank be thankful to the DIMAX leadership. At Morgan, we've hosted a, a number of reconnects. Mitch, you know, thank you. We, we hosted another uh, number of cicada meetings. And, um, and that's a big deal at a, a, a mid-sized historical black college when you have this R1 institution coming to your campus to spend a week with you, you know, and it generates a lot of energy. And it gives some credibility and in ways that you, you you guys don't know that 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 the impact that it has on on our campuses. So I, I think that's about all I, I really want to say. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll now go to Warren Powell. Uh, Warren is one of the the two engineers on the dais up here. Um, he is Professor of Operations Research and Financial Engineering at Princeton. Okay, I'm gonna um, sort of do a personal history. I'm gonna call this my shared history of learning with Dimax. I kind of put this together. I had a presentation put together and then I was sitting in the meeting yesterday and realizing I, I wanted to cover, do a different story. Uh, my career started with a uh, working on a trucking problem. I, we were told to work on applications. The thing is, uh, 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 trucking was, this is like Uber, where you have decisions and uncertainty all at the same time. And people didn't really know how to do that. Uh, I was working with a, uh, motivated by a, a very advanced company who was already using uh, modern analytics back in the 1970s, but they didn't know how to deal with uncertainty. And this started a whole path of working with trucking companies and railroads. Uh, we started to develop some ideas that we were calling starting to call, I think in those days, adaptive dynamic programming. Um, uh, we then started working with uh, net jets. Uh, trucking was a, what we call a two-layer resource allocation problem. Net jets was a three layers. We had aircraft, pilots, and customers. Uh, I actually worked on a five-layer problem with air products and chemicals. That got really complicated. Uh, this is roughly around when I started working on my first book on approximate dynamic programming in the early 2000s. 
uh, did a little bit of work on multi-agent problems and supply chains. Before I started moving off into energy, I love to tell my students, if you like to work on uh, optimization on uncertainty, you love energy because it's got so many different sources of uncertainty, uh, much more complex resource allocation, different types of uncertainty, uh, wind, solar, uh, uh, what the market's going to do, demand response. That little picture with the battery story, I've been working on that problem for about eight years. Uh, it's, it, and then we're still going strong. And then I started getting into the learning problems. So the slot machines is uh, representative of what's called the multi-arm bandit problem. You pull on a slot machine, you see what you earn, and, uh, uh, and, and it's a learning problem. And that took me into uh, drug discovery, uh, medical decision making, material science. Uh, this was a, a robotic controller where we needed an algorithm to tell the machine what experiment to do next. Now this is around when we started working with DIMAX and uh, this was a bioterrorism and, and uh, Homeland Security had great learning problems. They were much richer than the ones I had seen before. We started off with very vanilla problems. Try this, see what you learn, what should we try next? But now we had physical resources like the uh, state of vaccines or where people were. Uh, uh, we started doing some things with uh, Homeland Security. You had learning problems, what equipment, what's the right process, which people should be investigated. Um, uh, we took some nice problems with uh, terrorists running around New York City. You've got to love mathematics. You get to do whatever math you want. You just have to find a cool application. But it is the case the applications throw new issues at you. But that's always been a lot of fun. I always tell students, whatever you do in life, stay with the analytics. It'll respond to whatever problem you want. So this is my book on optimal learning. Uh, and this was information acquisition. And I started at a point in my career when I realized that I had been working on these decision problems under uncertainty, but I'd been working on a lot of different ones. And at some point I realized that I was pulling on techniques from all of these books and finding that they were all useful. I, for a period of time I thought I could solve anything with approximate dynamic programming. That turned out not to be true. But as I started to learn all the books, I started to find that there really was a commonality. And this is what I think the mathematical training does, is you start to look at things and you say, you know, with all these books, there's really actually only four classes of, we call them policies, methods of making decisions. And suddenly I started pulling all these together and have a book that you can download because it's not finished, but hey, it's free. Uh, just go to jungle.princeton.edu. I got an undergrad book, a grad book, I got tutorials, I got lecture notes. And, and it's really kind of exciting. So I was sitting in the room yesterday looking at all the different things that were, were taking place under DIMAX and realizing that all my activities could sort of fit in one corner of the room because you had these other mega fields like, like ecology and sustainability, uh, biology and health. I mean, this, these, these fields are huge. And by the way, I, there I was using discrete mathematics. You can't move half a truck around using statistics, machine learning, stochastic modeling. I mean, all these tools were coming together. And so what I love is how the, my diversity of experience in which DIMAX uh, contributed, and it was really neat coming up to DIMAX and seeing all the other different communities because, you know, we all eventually live in our departments, and the beautiful things about centers is you can come up and suddenly start. I, would, I, I think I interact with more people from computer science through DIMAX than I ever had at Princeton. Um, and so this was kind of neat. Let me just close real briefly by making a note. So there's a lot of interest in machine learning here. So machine learning, there it is at the top, and one of the things you need is big data set. You need observations. When you do an optimization or sequential decisions, you need a cost function or, or, or reward function. Um, so you don't need that big data set, but both fields are doing the same thing. Statistics and machine learning, we need a function. We call it a statistical model. We have the type of function we have to tune parameters. Turns out sequential decisions are doing the same thing. I just call them policies, but just think of them as functions, and you start to realize how the two fields are starting to come together. So I love the fact that it's application driven, but it's the mathematics that gives it that elegant framework, and you really do have to bring a community together. Thank you. is Al Wallace. Al is Professor of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Rensselaer Polytech. Uh, you wonder why I'm typically last. I'm a very, very popular author. Did you ever see Ed Al? Remember me? <laughs> uh, 
What I'd like to do, please, is just kind of bear with me, talk a little bit about uh, my personal as well as RPI's experience uh, with Rutgers uh, and with the center. And just so you all know that are academics, this is unusual. It's very unusual to have a long term, and I consider 10 years long, uh, maybe you don't, relationship that uh, will certainly go on after I have and was there before I was. Uh, it started with a fellow named Mark Goldberg, who has since retired, who was in computer science, came down, I think, for a year. Uh, and he is, his area is graph theory. Uh, now, graph theory turned out for me to be extremely important. It seems that networks appear every place. It was driven home. We did some work with uh, after 9-11 and trying to put together, back together again, the infrastructure in Manhattan was no trivial task. Uh, so that, that got me started essentially uh, worrying about worrying about graphs. So now, where did that take me? Uh, we were very fortunate to join with, uh, with Fred, and one of the problems we looked at, it's all new to me, is social media. Well, social media in and of itself creates graphs. And so, again, the graph phenomena kind of appeared. Uh, you want to put infrastructure in the ground, you have a graph. You want to develop kinship relationships, family, you have a graph. So, Mark Goldberg, I mentioned, is a graph theorist. I was very fortunate to be able to work with him on a couple of projects and found myself uh, very interested in traversing graphs. Uh, graphs as a symbolic relationship are fine, but I want to traverse them. And I want to see if I can traverse them. Why does that happen? It happens now in social media. It happens in uh, infrastructures. It happens in vehicles. Uh, can, do we really have a way to traverse the graph? Now, I also want to traverse it and some metric of some kind. Uh, let's say it's, uh, I want to have the metric, I want a pleasant ride. That's a metric. I want as safe as possible. I want timeliness. Not on time, remember? Timeliness. I also want on time. So we have a lot of uh, uh, areas that are read to, to me and, and essentially in what we might call a emergency or disaster response. Uh, I don't like to use the word disaster because uh, it seems like we're having more of them. Uh, so let's call them hazards or some other word because it seems like uh, events that typically we kind of took for granted just aren't, you can't take for granted anymore. Uh, now, so let's go back to the relationship. Uh, we were about 10 years, I think, working together in the 10 years, there were three faculty members for computer science, a faculty member for mathematics, and a faculty member, three faculty members from ISE, our department, who were funded, not, not, not people that, that we you know, had meetings with and talked with, people who were actually funded through this program. Okay. And people whose students were funded. I tried, to, I tried to add up the number of students, I'm sorry, our books aren't that good. I failed. I can, I, we don't have a few. One's a faculty member at the University of Arkansas. One is a faculty member at the University of Delaware. Uh, another one just finished his, I don't know whether you call the initial training for a police officer for the city of Yonkers. And he has a master's degree with us and worked on one of the current projects. Uh, so that, that has been just unbelievable in terms of help for us. Now, have we helped anybody else? Well, I think we have. I think we provided some help and guidance to the Coast Guard. Uh, we know we worked very hard at some of the work that originally was started with uh, the Navy Research or Army Research Labs and looking at how we can really, again, our little problem was uh, the, the social media part of it, how they can use that part of it, and again, using network analysis. So I, I feel pretty comfortable uh, that we've made a contribution that's outside of our education and the research organizations. And this is all due 
to, yes, RPI, yes, Rutgers, yes, Army, yes, uh, Coast Guard, yes, all the people that funded us. But it's really, really based upon the relationship that I was very fortunate to have with the folks here at Rutgers in particular, in particular Fred Roberts. So thank you, Fred. Now, I'll, can I take a minute and just, I, I, while I do this, again, remember, I, so we started out with graphs. Now we're working with graphs for, uh, we're fortunate to continue with George Mason. Uh, I'm kind of helping, but really the real work's being done by uh, Bolectic Szymanski in the Computer Science Department, and a person who we helped get tenure, and a member, a member of our faculty, Tom Sharkey, who's working on it. And this is in trying to take, and can we model criminal organizations and their activities as a graph? And can, uh, then again, can we work with this graph structure and interdict? First, we have to describe, and that's our folks in computer science. All look at the students are working to try to take the data. Can we subscribe? And then once we get, we feel pretty good about the, about the network uh, and what it consists of, money laundering, hash, cocaine, transportation. Turns out all these, all these have, a, have a transportation component. It's, uh, it's typically, sometimes it's even organized, meaning there is a transportation company that provides the transportation for more than one group, typically headed around particular cities, but the product itself can come any place in the world. Uh, so the question is now, how do we take that and how do we interdict? Uh, this, this work? We can stand at the podium. Yeah, we started out. Uh, we started out with one of the biggest problems we have here. We tried with Chicago. We got some data out of Chicago, but not enough to really use uh, for a data set for Montreal. We started out with uh, and uh, enabled us to develop. In this case, the four organizations. The organizations involved were Hash, um, Hash, Cocaine and the transportation. And the other key ingredient is laundering money. Uh, I don't want to get started uh, how money is moving around the world today. Uh, I know which, 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 just click, click over here. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, first of all is to develop the network and then form edge projections. So we're predicting the red lines are, are are connections that don't exist. This was a data set based on phone calls. The uh, police in Montreal had tapped into phones and had phone lines, and uh, these are now, we, based upon an assessment scheme, we predict to be existing, additional existing things. Well, Sorry. Uh, to continue, with, I don't know what, what happened there, do you? Sorry. Uh, we continued with the work to uh, uh, essentially interdict, and interdict means traversing the network. Uh, we've had some difficulties because the uh, energy programming work we're, we're doing is computationally pretty tough, uh, so we are working on that kind of a problem. And the last is both of uh, both Oleg and Tom have worked together, and I think there's going to be existing funding back from the Army again to continue that project. And all of this was due to our, our working together with, uh, with Fred and Dimax. Thank you.